This video is sponsored by Squarespace. Oh no, I need to get rid of the algae in my pond, but I've bought too much algicide. If only there were a way to turn all of this excess into CNC machined parts. If you have this weirdly specific problem, then continue watching because that's what we'll be doing in this video. Algicide is typically made from copper sulfate, which is also used to get rid of fungus, weeds, or roots in pipes. Basically, it's not very friendly to microorganisms. But I didn't make this video to talk about biology. Rather, I'm interested in the copper part of the copper sulfate. Copper sulfate is made from reacting copper metal with sulfuric acid. It consists of one copper atom attached to a sulfate, or SO4 ion. At least, that's what its anhydrous form looks like, but 99% of the time, the copper sulfate you'll run into is the heptahydrate variety, which means that it has five water molecules along for the ride. It has a beautiful deep blue color, and it's really good for growing big crystals. The molar weight of hydrated copper sulfate is 250 grams, of which 63.5 is copper, meaning that by mass, 25.4% is copper metal. So considering I can get a big bag of copper sulfate for about $2 per pound, that means I'd be paying just under $8 per pound of copper. At the time of recording this video, rates I was able to find for scrap copper were around $5 to $7 per pound, so while extracting it from copper sulfate might not be the absolute cheapest method, it's actually not a bad price if you had no other choice. So if you're in a pinch or just happen to have copper sulfate already, it's actually an okay option. And if you're unfortunate enough to have to take care of a pond, you may well have some lying around right now. Okay, that's all well and good, but how do you actually get the copper out of the copper sulfate? One way is to use electrolysis. When you pass a current through a solution of it, copper will build up on the cathode, and as an added bonus, once you extract all the copper, you're left with sulfuric acid, which can be useful in and of itself. However, this method takes a long time and a lot of energy, so I'm going to use another method which involves just dissolving scrap metal. See, if you take a metal that's more reactive than copper and dunk it in a solution of copper sulfate, a single displacement reaction will occur where the sulfate ion drops the copper and bonds to the more reactive metal instead, leaving the copper to precipitate out. And as you can see from the scale, most metals are more reactive than copper, so just about any scrap metal you've got laying around will probably work. There's a lot of demos online of people using aluminum, but I was worried about having unreacted aluminum flakes contaminating the copper precipitate, so I opted to use iron instead because theoretically I should be able to separate it out with a magnet. Well, unless it oxidizes. I'm pretty sure galvanized steel should work too, since zinc is also more reactive than copper, so it'll just form zinc sulfate instead of iron sulfate if it reacts. So I'll start by filling up a beaker with two liters of distilled water and then add 450 grams of copper sulfate. Then I found some steel I wasn't using and threw it in. Within minutes, clumps of copper form on the surface of the steel. If you didn't know, you might mistake this for rust, but it is actually copper. I left the metal in the solution for a week, and when I came back, it had turned green since iron sulfate had been formed in place of copper sulfate. The smaller rods have had their diameter reduced a little bit from being dissolved. After filtering off the iron sulfate solution and drying the precipitate, I was left with what looks like reddish dirt, but this is actually copper powder that precipitated out. Weighing it out, I end up with 100 grams. In theory, there should have been 114 grams of copper metal out of the 450 grams of copper sulfate, which puts me at 88% yield. Also, you may notice that the copper powder is quite a bit darker than a typical chunk of copper, and I think that's because a lot of it oxidized during the process of drying. Now, in theory, when I melt this down, the oxide should burn off. Copper oxide is peculiar in that with enough heat, it will actually decompose back into pure copper metal and oxygen. You can see this pretty clearly on this piece of copper pipe. When I heat it a little bit, initially it turns black from oxidation, but then when I put the flame directly on it, the heat breaks down the oxide layer and makes this shiny clean area of pure copper metal. So in theory, the same thing should happen when I go to melt down my oxidized copper dust. 100 grams isn't very much copper, so I decided to scale up my production a little bit, and this time I filled a 2-gallon bucket and added 1,800 grams of copper sulfate. This time I'll be dissolving scrap aluminum because iron was taking way too long to dissolve. The catch here is that aluminum exposed to the atmosphere rapidly forms an oxide layer, and this is difficult for the copper sulfate to get through, so I'm adding a few spoonfuls of table salt to get some chlorine ions in the mix that will act as a catalyst by stripping the aluminum oxide layer off. Then I throw in some shredded aluminum foil and then the scrap plate. Here's a 30x speed time lapse. The dissolving of aluminum happens way faster than iron, finishing in a matter of hours rather than days. After about 20 minutes, the bucket was getting hot and bubbling. And here's the scrap plate after just one hour. Man, that's pretty ugly. You know what else is ugly? This. This thing right here. According to archaeologists, this is a website from the World Wide Web. 
Using carbon dating, they've determined that it's from the year 1998. Now, if you're a business type of person doing very businessy things, you're going to need a website that looks modern and professional and not like a prehistoric cave wall drawing. And Squarespace is the perfect service for that. Squarespace provides all the tools you need to build and host a website for your business. Graphic design, media integration, payment processing, inventory management, appointment scheduling, traffic analytics, and even the ability to run ads on social media for your business. Squarespace has it all in one easy to use system that doesn't require any programming knowledge. Whether you're a neighborhood kid selling lemonade or a big shot Wall Street guy running a giant multinational cryptocurrency scam, I mean brokerage, Squarespace is able to cover all your website needs. I mean, seriously, who's got the time to learn HTML or PHP? We're on the brink of world war and you should probably be learning to dig a trench, not worry about website coding. Go to squarespace.com for a free trial. And if you want to launch a website, go to squarespace.com slash hyperspace pirate to save 10% on your first purchase of a website or domain. Okay, now back to dissolving things. Here's the aftermath of the reaction with all the copper dust sunk into the bottom of the bucket. You may also notice that the original blue color is almost completely gone, and that's because the aluminum sulfate solution, which has replaced the copper sulfate solution, is clear. I poured off the aluminum sulfate solution into a separate bucket and was left with some very wet, mushy copper goo. Now, if I tried to dry this right now, that would be a bad idea because some aluminum sulfate salt would be left behind as the moisture evaporated. So I rinsed the copper by completely filling the bucket with fresh water and then draining it off. And I did that three times to make sure that I got rid of any water soluble contaminants and only had copper left. This time I ended up with 475 grams, meaning I definitely had some moisture left over because 100% yield would be 458 grams. Well, either way, there's a decent amount. I cooked up a couple more buckets full of copper sulfate and aluminum until I ended up with a little over a thousand grams of copper, and then I called it good. I got this propane furnace thing off Amazon and fired about 50 grams of the copper powder in it. I let it run for around an hour, and as it started to get dark outside, I could pretty clearly see the glowing copper in the crucible, but I didn't see the shiny blob of liquid I was expecting, just a crumbly looking mess. The result was just ash, no copper metal. I put some of the ash in a jar and added 40% vinegar, and it turned bluish green, so that tells me this stuff was copper oxide. For some reason, the copper oxide didn't decompose as I expected it to. To try and fix this, I'm going to mix in some of the flux I use when I braise copper to brass. I also cleaned my copper powder and vinegar to ensure any residual oxidation was scrubbed out, which is why it's wet when I'm adding it here. Not a great idea because of boiling, but oh well. Once the copper was in, I added a bunch of the flux and fired my furnace again. It was using so much propane that the tank started to get cold and form condensation on the bottom. When I looked in the furnace after about 20 minutes, I saw the shiny blob of molten metal I was expecting, and it was dancing and wiggling around in a pretty funny way. I poured the molten copper out into a 40 by 40 millimeter cube mold, and it immediately started bubbling and swelling up. I think I added way too much flux. You can also see it happening in the leftover copper inside the crucible. It left behind these lumps of slag that made the ingot look like broccoli. The rest of the ingot looked like crap too. There were tons of pores on the outside and probably even more on the inside that we can't see, so I decided to remelt it. This time I preheated the mold by putting it near the furnace exhaust to try and get a more stable casting and eliminate any possibility of voids from steam bubbles and that sort of thing. However, I forgot that concrete has water in it and the intense heat of the mold caused the pavement to crack and pop. Here's the aftermath of the concrete popping so bad that it flipped over my mold. So yeah, make sure to use fire brick or sand when you put your mold down. The second pour turned out a little better, but I still wasn't too happy with it, so I remelted it along with some more copper dust. This time I got enough to mostly fill the cube mold and part of a rectangular ingot mold. This cube is pretty lumpy on top, but I think it's good enough to use as machining stock, so I set it up on my CNC mill that I built for a video several years ago. The greatest strength of my homemade mill is comedy, because it's so bad that it's funny. I shaved 5mm off the lumpy top of the ingot, but I guess I gotta take a little more because it still looks pretty rough. I'm using a 1 8 inch end mill traveling 10mm per second with a cut depth of 0.1mm. Like I said, this thing is terrible. I also shaved down the backside of the ingot, which I found has a big cavity right in the middle from an air pocket. At least now it's mostly uniform looking though. Next, I shaved down the four sides until I had a nice uniform cube and a crap ton of copper shavings. It actually came out pretty nice, and it's oddly satisfying to hold and play with. Here's a comparison between the machine cube and another ingot I cast. 
As for the shavings, I scooped them up into a jar and poured in a little bit of hydrogen peroxide and then some sulfuric acid. Here you can see them turning back into copper sulfate, and after filtering and boiling off some of the solution, I'm back to the little blue crystals of copper sulfate that I started with. And that's pretty much how the circle of life works. Anyway, a plain cube is kind of boring, so I decided to turn it into a decorative piece by machining a maze into the top face, which turned out pretty nice. The bottom face was a disaster though, and it looks like I'll need to fine tune my feeds and speeds a little more for cutting copper. Then for the sides I milled in some stair steps in a sort of reversed pyramid kind of shape. The end result is interesting, but pretty rough looking on account of my CNC not really being able to handle copper, which kind of surprised me since it doesn't have a problem with brass or aluminum. This is just decorative and not meant to be functional, so maybe if I make it look like some sort of ancient artifact I can justify crappy machining. If I use the right acid to age it, maybe I can convince everyone that it's actually a valuable Bronze Age artifact. If I leave a part exposed to acid fumes, but not in direct contact with the acid itself, I should be able to give it a nice aged look by corroding just the surface without actually eating away huge chunks of the underlying material. Here's an example of an ingot in a sealed jar with fumes from nitric acid. I tried sulfuric acid, ammonia, nitric acid, acetic acid, aka vinegar, and hydrochloric acid. The sulfuric acid didn't do much other than darkening the copper a little bit. I think it needs to be heated up to actually have a decent effect from the fumes because it has a relatively low vapor pressure compared to the other acids. The ammonia fumes left a really nice dark blue color which I think is copper hydroxide. I think it must have grown tiny crystals on the surface because it glitters when you hold it at a certain angle to the light. The nitric acid fumes left the classic bluish green corrosion color like you'd see on the Statue of Liberty or on an ancient bronze or copper artifact. Only problem is it could be rubbed or scratched off the surface really easily. The concentrated vinegar fumes left the most consistent pattern with a dark green color from copper acetate. I'm pretty sure copper acetate is toxic though, so I'm not sure I'd want this stuff just hanging around my house. Finally, the hydrochloric acid fumes left a corrosion color that was pretty similar to the nitric acid, but with weird white spots in between. I'm pretty sure the green is copper chloride, but I'm not sure about the white stuff. I think my favorite look was the copper hydroxide from the ammonia fumes, so I went ahead and sealed the cube in a jar with 3% ammonia. Here's how it looked after a week. Not useful for anything, but a pretty neat looking little chunk of material. So that takes care of the cube, now we've got to do something with that rectangular ingot. As before, I need to shave down the lumpy surface before I can do anything worthwhile with it. How about making a self-portrait out of copper? Every sociopathic narcissist needs a statue of themselves made out of metal. This time I reduced my cutting depth to 0.05 millimeter and my feed rate down to about 5 millimeters per second, running bits between 1 8 inch to 0.7 millimeters for different features of the cut. This produced much better results on my crappy mill, but also generated ultra-fine dust that was more like glitter than chips or shavings. After a little cleaning with a file and a belt sander, I've got a little copper version of myself, and even added a little hole in the back so I can screw in a loop to use this as a necklace or a keychain or something like that. So what did we learn? Well, with enough free time and a garbage CNC mill, you can convert algicide into copper parts. It's definitely not as cost effective as buying scrap copper and melting it down, but when society collapses, you might not have access to scrap copper and you might want to turn your pond chemicals into keychains. So who's going to have the last laugh when that happens? Well, probably not me, because I'll be dead from radiation poisoning. Okay, bye.